I want to begin with a quote from a New York Times op-ed last week, Adam. Normal talk, here's the quote, about globalization and competitiveness is directed inward to the nation. It serves as a call to discipline and hard work. Mr. Trump is taking the idea and pointing it outward, calling out his supposed foes. In doing so, he deliberately fosters economic nationalism. Talk to us about this phenomenon. What exactly is happening with globalization and nationalism right now? Yeah, I think the thing we have to do is distinguish between the kind of run of the mill competitiveness talk, the preoccupation with national survival in the global market that's been commonplace and is, of course, simply an effect of globalization um, and is spoken all the time in all sorts of different fora, Davos, on the news media, and so on. From what President Trump seems to be doing, which is in a sort of antagonistic relationship. I mean, for me, the shock was, and I think for many people, the description of the EU as a foe. He immediately backpedaled to say they're not bad guys, they're just competing hard. But when you turn a competitive relationship into something more like a boxing match, you're changing the nature of the game for everyone in world trade. And in fact, you say there's a cognitive dissonance, because this is what President Trump is so brilliant at, with the Brexiteers and, you know, potentially the leaders of Italy and other nations right now. Manufacturing and also finance are cross-border now and this cognitive dissonance is being sort of used to, to give them more power. It's deeply confusing. If you ask what is the largest car exporter from the United States to China, with which America actually runs a surplus, it's BMW and its Spartanburg production plant in South Carolina, which is BMW's largest production facility in the world. If you ask what blue-collar Americans actually drive, the constituency that Trump is supposedly pursuing this policy in the interest of, they drive compact cars imported from Mexico and South Korea. So the sense of the car industry as an American industry is a figment really of Trump's imagination, an echo from a past period of the 1950s and 60s where you know, it really was true that what was good for GM was good for the United States. That in that simple sense is no longer true. Where do we end up with all of this? We're clearly seeing trade wars play out and yet President Trump came out last week and talked about free trade and fair trade. What happens? Does it take the midterms and beyond to sort of see where both parties stand economically? It's an astonishingly confusing picture. It's running at multiple different speeds in several different directions at once. The NAFTA renegotiation, the EU tension, the Sino-American, the Chinese-American standoff, those are all three completely different economic configurations. And all of this is then scrambled by the internal confusion within the Trump administration, where you have the president himself making policy on the spur. You have a struggle between the Mnuchins and the Lighthizers. And then you have the bureaucratic procedures of an investigation like the one that's now been run in the auto industry, which could run for an entire year. And the rest of the world, of course, has to respond to this confusion and has to respond to the fact that the Americans actually pulled the trigger on steel and aluminium. So that adds a further variable of uncertainty because this week the large auto producers of the world have to meet. It's just a matter of due diligence to consider their uh, possible responses to an American escalation. That adds fundamental radical uncertainty into a realm which, uh, until two years ago, I think people thought of as one of the steady features of the global economy, especially the auto industry, one of the deepest integrated sectors in the global economy. Fundamental radical uncertainty. Adam, this is something that the markets have to navigate with. We're called Bloomberg Markets. I'm looking at how the market reaction digests this because we've had today learnings from Caterpillar talking of up to a $200 million tariff-related material cost headwind. We've got Tyson Foods also talking about cutting its forecast, blaming the trade dispute. Talk to us about the ramifications across several sectors of the trade dispute that we currently see. Yes, it's ramifying. Also, also in part because of the tit-for-tat quality of this, all of a sudden you find U.S. agriculture in the firing line. One of the great success stories of globalization for farming communities across the U.S., soya all of a sudden turns out to be a bad bet, or BMW finds itself in the crosshire, not simply because um, it uh, sells a lot of fancy cars that Trump sees on Park Avenue, but also because it's the largest American car exporter to China, and it finds itself caught up in those interconnections. And this is even before we start talking about sectors 
like tech, where you can find a major merger uh, between a European and American chip, produ a chip producer foiled by uh, the refusal of Chinese regulators to give the green light. So we're seeing across a range of sectors in the global economy a shaking of the fundamental assumptions about what the future looked like and where we were headed. The consequences of that in markets we see. We see uh, the prices of auto stock gyrating. Um, there are very serious uncertainties which market actors will now have to hedge against. And all of that, of course, comes with costs. Interestingly, though, as we see the shaking of the markets in terms of auto sector, for example, we saw gangbusters in terms of U.S. economic growth. Now, when I'm looking at that, we saw perhaps one-off events. In fact, the trade uncertainty maybe pushed exports higher than they would have normally be and that the crowing of 4.1 percent growth might have to be dialed back going forward. When do you think that the trade tensions will heat, hit economic growth and, and bring something to bear to President Trump? Yeah, there's a massive bow wave effect from the impending tariffs with people stocking up on U.S. soy, particularly. We think that 1% bump on the trade side is almost entirely down to ag, I think. Um, so that's going to disappear uh, as we move forward through the year. Uh, with Brexit, uh, we see a similar phenomenon. And the question really, I think, is the long-term impact uh, on investment in particular and the rearrangement of supply chains at a global level. If you look at FDI numbers into the United States, uh, those have fallen off very shortly. Uh, there's uncertainty on both sides, for instance, of Chinese real estate investors, uh, whether or not it's any longer uh, going to be possible for them to take money out of China or put it into the United States in a reliable way. So I think those kind of effects are going to come through over the medium rather than the immediate and short term. I want to mention your book, The Wages of Destruction, The Making and Breaking of the Nazi Economy and Economic History of the Third Reich, which was written in the pretty early 2000s. If you were to write a new afterword or a new introduction, what parallels to today do you see? Well, the really alarming parallel is the significance of the United States leadership in the world economy and with regard to liberal politics uh, or its absence. If you want to ask what, of, uh, what the switches are which fundamentally change the parameters under which somebody like Hitler came to power, but also the switch which flicked, which allowed uh, Japanese imperialists off the hook, or Mussolini in the early 1930s, it is the waning confidence on the part of elites in all of those countries that they can count on a future shaped by a American power in a constructive sense. This was the gamble of the 1990s with regard to China as well. If we build it, they will come. If we build uh, the liberal framework, China will emerge and it will emerge, as we used to say, as a responsible stakeholder. China has certainly emerged. Um, it has emerged in an extremely challenging way. If we give up on that play at this point, um, it reorientates the decision making of everyone in the region, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, uh, in Vietnam, regimes, uh, administrations, governments, which orientated themselves towards a long game on the part of America, represented, of course, by TPP, which was just written off in the first days of the Trump administration.